Thank you very much, uh, Scott, and very generous and somewhat exaggerated remarks. <laughs> and now for a change of pace from the uh, ardent battles on the Mediterranean. The interpretation of any event or series of events in history, of course, is susceptible to debate generally so. Not so in the case of the events of which I wish to speak this morning. I want to talk to you this morning about Fatima, about the holy and supernatural events which took place outside a little Portuguese village, all in the course of one year, 1917. Now this is history of a very special sort, because it's a supernatural intervention into the world of man. 
1917, it was, of course, a time when the world was deadlocked in a grim struggle of World War I. And there, in that obscure corner of Europe, so far from the main action, so far from the world's focus of attention, in a series of holy apparitions and attending signs and miracles of biblical proportion, heaven sent the most exalted messenger to earth, with the most urgent of messages for all humanity. First, to wake up and warn the Christian people of God's righteous judgment, an impending judgment. And I'm not sure that we've still heard this today. And also to enable the world and to draw the world to believe in Jesus Christ. And thus to give us both warning and hope. So let me say at the outset that I see Fatima and its message as something very serious, even grim. Though I would add with strong notes of hope. Now I count myself as being far from a Catholic triumphal. In fact, much of our history makes me sad. That is why I cannot offer this talk as a Catholic cheerlead. Fatima is an extraordinary grace from God to us by way of being a wake-up call, a warning to turn us away from our otherwise sinful ways. A warning is rendered useless unless it is heeded. Fatima is nothing to pat ourselves on the back for, something for us to thank God for. It contains a real rebuke for prevailing Catholic laxity, still a problem today. And I'm concerned because I see the displeasure of God hanging heavily over the bulk of our people not over our country. Self-contented, self-deceived by pride, <coughs> lulled by affluence, often indifferent to the sins of our culture. I do not want to chide uncharitably, but I hate to see this gracious message from God so much taken for granted. Now, I will assume that most of you here are familiar with the basic story of Fatima. So my talk will be more in the nature of a reflection, a reflection on a supernatural intervention into human history. And on such a grand scale. And then there's the matter of the actual messages themselves and of our proper reception of them. I will give only a summary account of the actual events at Fatima, just to refresh the memories of the many and to acquaint those who may not have heard or realized the import of these happenings. I think we can begin on May 13, 1917, when a 10-year-old Lucia Dos Santos and her younger cousins, Jacinta and Francisco Mato, were tending sheep at the Cova de Iria near Fatima. It was about noon. There was some lightning. So, thinking it was about to rain, as you might expect, the children began to run for cover. It was then that the apparition of this beautiful woman appeared above a small tree. Lucia later described the woman as brighter than the sun, shedding rays of light clearer and stronger than 
any crystal ball filled with the most sparkling water and pierced by burning rays of the sun. <clears throat> this lady of the light was holding a rosary in one hand. And she spoke to the children, telling them not to be afraid and saying, I come from heaven. Then the lady asked the children to attend her at this place for six months in succession. Now, this is the 13th day of May. And so on the 13th day of each month and at the same hour, same place, the children would come. And the lady said, then I will tell you who I am and what I want. And after this, I will return here a seventh time. Now, there are many books, as you well know, most of you, I think, about Fatima, some quite straightforward, some excellent treatments, others more controversial. But for the basic story in an easy read, in case there's anybody here really not familiar with Fatima, I usually point people to that old standby, Our Lady of Fatima by William Thomas Walsh. Walsh. That was first printed in 1947. So, if you want a fuller account and an easy read, I'll point you there. At any rate, the apparitions began in May and continued month by month thereafter until October. With the heavenly woman urging the children all along to do penance and acts of reparation to make sacrifices to save sinners even those most in need of God's mercy all of which these children did readily and there were visions and experience which moved the children and sometimes terrified them but again, the basic message, as I see it, and this is what I want to underscore, had to do, very simple, had to do with sin and judgment, with offending our Lord Jesus Christ, and a startling wake-up call, calling the faithful to listen and obey, to turn from sin and offer reparation for the conversion of sinners. In fact, I would say it was more than a wake-up call. It was a dire warning about impending earthly disasters and also very vivid and terrifying prospects of an eternal hell of fire. Not a pleasant passing notice. Moreover, in the course of these apparitions, according to Lucia's own account, the lady gave the children three special messages, known generally as the three secrets of Fatima. And I, I merely mention these here in passing, as it were, because it is not my purpose to go into them in any detail or to address any particular controversy over the church's understanding of the consecration of Russia except to say that Fatima mentions the terrible consequences of the spread of Russian errors throughout the world. And we must remember that this was in October of 1917 and a full month before the Communist Revolution. Let it suffice to say that these messages were prophetic and eschatological. But back to the story here. As word got out, it drew many people the talk of visions and miracles. This brings us to the great miracle of Fatima. I cut to that at this point. That occurred on the 13th of October, the so-called dance of the sun, or the miracle of the sun. Now bear in mind that as early as July, two months prior, Our Lady had promised that for the last of her apparitions, she would give a sign so that all the world would believe. That says something. A crowd of approximately, and I've heard have different estimates of this, but I'll say approximately 70,000 people, people of every sort and of every station of life, came out to a rain-soaked field that day 
The mass of this people included those who were eager to believe, maybe even some who were a little too eager to believe, those who were merely curious, and those who were hostile, downright hostile. It included, and I wish to stress this, modern newspaper men and photographers, the modern secular press, all gathered here at the Copa de Iria. The rain had finally ceased, and there was a thin layer of clouds that day. So, in fact, the people, as they later reported, uh, could look at the veiled sun without hurting their eyes. And then, at a certain point, after waiting quite a long time, actually an overly long time, so it seemed, Lucia was suddenly moved by what she described as an inner interior impulse to direct the crowd to look at the sun. And there, and then, at that moment, occurred the most spectacular, promised miracle. Witnesses saw the sun appearing to change colors, to spin around the sky, sending off great flashes of light. Mind you, not everyone saw the same thing. That's an important detail. And witnesses gave widely varying descriptions of the sun's dance. But the phenomenon was witnessed by most people in the crowd, as well as, and I would stress this, people miles away who had never bothered to go up to the cove. They saw it too. They say that it was seen for up to 40 kilometers away. And it was registered by scientists at the time. Yet in Lisbon, farther away yet, the day proceeded as normal. There was no disturbance recorded, no disturbance witnessed. And how could the sun or the earth leave their appointed courses without utter destruction? How could this be? Three times the sun seemed to move toward the observers and then drew back. <clears throat> On the last apparent approach of the sun, people were witnessing what looked to them like the end of the world, and the temperature got hot, and when it was all over, the field was dry. 70,000 people in a 20th century European context experienced this with the press present. You think that would make quite a stir. Obviously, something unprecedented had occurred in the most astounding and public way. But no possible reasonable explanation. No secular explanation. This was a sign from heaven given in the recorded history of the modern world, just as promised, and at the appointed time. Yet not all the witnesses saw the sun dance. Some people only saw the radiant colors, and others, including some believers, saw nothing at all. How do you explain that? It's not a simple illusion. I want you to hold that thought just for a moment, because I want to say just a bit more about what the children witnessed. For they saw something quite different. While the crowd was staring at the sun, the children, Lucia, Francisco, and Jacinta, later reported seeing images, uh, tableau, if you will, of the Holy Family, Our Lady of Sorrows, with Jesus, and then Our Lady of Mount Carmel, and they saw Saint Joseph and Jesus blessing the people. Now that's what the people, the, the children said. Now, you might be inclined to dismiss a child's story, but for the fact that there was this most incredible miracle in the presence of 70,000 people. On cue, a news columnist of the time, Avelino de Almeida of Osecro, Portugal's most influential newspaper at the time, which was pro-government and therefore anti-clerical, wrote the following, and I quote, this is what the columnist wrote. 
before the astonished eyes of the crowd whose aspect was biblical. As they stood bareheaded, eagerly searching the sky, the sun trembled and made sudden incredible movements outside the cosmic laws. The sun danced. And so he saw it, and so he reported it. But the question remains, what explanations can be made or even suggested? Well, I've come up with four. Mass hysteria. Yeah, but not everyone was affected, not in the same way. And I've never actually heard of a case on such a scale of mass hysteria in so diverse a crowd. And what about those who saw the same thing miles away? They could not possibly have been part of a mass hysteria. Okay, well, let's set that one aside. Irritations of the eyes. <laughs> well, perhaps for those staring at the sun for a prolonged time. But they weren't staring at the sun for a prolonged time. No evidence that these people, even those expecting the miracle, were staring at the sun before Lucia spoke. Most would have been focused on the tree where the children expected to see Our Lady. Perhaps, uh, this is my third one, and this is the one I like, perhaps little green men in flying saucers were merely playing with the earthlings by generating with some unknown technology this illusion. Now, of course, that's ridiculous. In a more sinister vein, perhaps this was a demonic deception. Well, there are people out there, name the name of Christian, and who believe that sort of thing. Yeah, but what did the vision say? What did the different visions that these children saw, what, did, what, what, what was the import? Listen to Jesus and turn from sin. Now, just how demonic does that sound? <laughs> I guess Satan's decided to go out of business. <laughs> Now, on this last point, <clears throat> and I take this seriously, we laugh, but I take this seriously, I am reminded of Jesus' words to the Pharisees who suggested that he cast out demons by satanic power. You may remember the story. The Pharisees said, it is only be by Beelzebul, uh, the prince of demons, that this man casts out demons. And knowing their thoughts, Jesus said to them, every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste. And no city or house divided against itself will stand. And if Satan casts out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? And if I cast out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore they shall be your judges. But if it is by the Spirit of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Now, Jesus goes on to say, and this is the scary part, Therefore I tell you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven men, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. And whoever says a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or in the age to come. Now, wow, that is terrifying. And it's saying that if you're confronted with what must be from God, and you harden your heart against it, you run a terrible risk. And it terrified me when years ago I sat pondering how I, how I, as a Protestant, could deal with this Marian apparition. I was a Protestant pastor at the time. I'd come from a very good, academically excellent Protestant seminary where I never heard a single word about Fatima. That was very convenient for them. I only knew the name and that it marked the place of some alleged Marian miracle. Now it is my conviction that everyone should hear it. When heaven finds it necessary to send so great a biblical style miracle into our times, uh, call it a mighty wake-up call from God, especially for all Catholics. 
But I believe also that no Protestant or any other person of any other faith and goodwill can afford to ignore it. You know the mere name Catholic, the team jersey as it were, is not going to save anyone. <coughs> we must all believe, really believe, and stop sinning and turn to Christ. This is serious business beyond all cultural or nominal Catholicism or just sliding by the message of Fatima calls us to get serious, even today. In my case, I encountered Fatima by reading a large blue book that was as poorly written and as poorly edited as any book I have ever seen. <laughs> Literally, that's true. However, I was compelled to read it. While I was ill and laid up in a small room in Topeka, Kansas, my uh, friends at the time here who, who maintained this place had picked up this particular book at a library sale of rejects. <laughs> but there was nothing else for me to do in that little cell but to read this book. I needed it to distract me. So I had only this one big blue book, thank God. And there I learned about Fatima. And I pondered it. I said, well, if this be true, what are the implications? Since some of the messages were directed to the Holy Father in Rome, some concerned him, it gave an impetus for me to reconsider with fresh interest, the claims of Rome more seriously. It also made a compelling case for using the rosary, which I began to do from that point on. And when I returned to my congregation in Chicago, I introduced it to our people there, and we began to pray it with great effect. This also helped me on my way, but that's another story but it's got some good chapters in it. <laughs> I should also point out one more thing about Fatima, in case you're still wondering about the prophecies. The three children said that the lady had prophesied, among other things, a great sign in the night sky that would precede a second great war. <clears throat> on that point, concerning that point, on January 25th, Feast of St. Paul, Conversion of St. Paul, 1938. The most extraordinary lights of an aurora borealis appeared all over the northern hemisphere, including places as far south as North Africa. This would be the widest occurrence of the aurora borealis since 1709, more than 200 years prior. Lucia herself declared that this was the sign foretold and so informed her superior and also her bishop in letters the very next day. Just over a month later, Hitler seized Austria. Eight months later, he invaded Czechoslovakia. And I think you know the rest of that story. So if we accept this history, what are we to do about it? That's the real question. Let's go back to emphasize the basic message, to pray, make reparation for sins in order to, to convert sinners, which by the way, and I want to make this point, in the church's understanding is not to be interpreted as just referring to bringing people from outside into the Roman church, but rather to bring people back in general to an obedience to Christ. It refers to all who have fallen away particularly those who have fallen into traps of sins of the flesh and certain other sins. And that, I think, is very rampant today. This cannot be a demonic deception. Now, I'm asking all of you this morning to reflect with me on the grim truths conveyed by this message from heaven and to evaluate how far or how well we are, we're doing with them. 
I say grim truth, but I, I, I want to say a grim truth that leads to a hope that will not disappoint if taken to heart. But we must give up our rose-colored glasses or any notion of Catholic faith as an innocuous opiate for non-challenging religious comfort. This lives up to the radicality of the gospel. We say history matters. Well, that of course depends on how you use it. To say that history matters presupposes that there are useful lessons to be drawn from past events and experiences and that we are going to heed them. Many times, history is falsely interpreted. Partly or wholly erroneous conclusions are drawn from it. And false applications to the present situation are sometimes attempted. All right, we all know that. But in this case, there is another danger too, more widespread, perhaps even more dangerous. People tend either to become oblivious to history's most apparent lessons, or if they are aware of them, as I think many Catholics should be, a Fatima, they may tend to ignore the more unpleasant aspects. For those of us who are Catholic, we may be able to talk at length about the details of Fatima or other church-approved apparitions and yet fail to put into timely practice the remedies that lie within our own reach and our own sphere of action. God forbid. History does matter. And Fatima's divine intrusion into our time and space calls us to get the message right and to apply it properly and with urgency. With Fatima, the event interprets itself and the application is spelled out by Our Lady, at least the parts that most concern us. But we have to embrace it. And I don't think that Catholics as a whole really get it. I don't see the evidence for that. I believe in these messages heartily, fervently. I just don't see our people getting it. And that's not just their problem, that's our problem. Now my own field, if I can call it that, is biblical and I tend to look at things through that lens words of Christ and the prophets, which is also the lens of the saints and the teachers of the church. How does Fatima square with a biblical perspective? 100%. Which of the prophets didn't complain about the so-called people of God being lax? In the Sermon on the Mount, didn't our Lord say, Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted? That's not the voice I always hear coming from our pulpits. There is plenty to mourn over. Better get busy. Didn't he also say in that same sermon, Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide, and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life and those who find it are few. Isn't that sobering? In the Sermon on the Plain, didn't Jesus say, Woe to you that are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you that are full now, for you shall hunger. Woe to you that laugh now, you shall mourn and weep. America is intent, including Catholics, on entertaining themselves to death. This is a grim thought from the Sermon on the Plain that we need to apply to life in the suburbs and throughout all of America. Didn't St. Paul warn his new converts 
Quote, through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. I'd like to hear that coming from an RCIA program. <laughs> and later he said, indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. All who even want to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will have problems. They will be persecuted. And from the saints, what a catalog of lament. St. Teresa of Avila's famous comment, I saw souls falling like snowflakes into hell. Well, that's not a cheery thought. <laughs> <laughs> but we have Catholic cheerleaders all around us. What is the message of God? It is a message of hope and mercy and love, but you have to realize we are being rescued from a world of sin. St. Francis Xavier also lamented, how many souls turn away from the road to glory and go to hell? I could go on and we'd be here for the rest of the day. We need to take this seriously. The question is not how often we hear this or the authenticity of this message, it's how we embrace it in our lives, in our families, in our day-to-day -day work. My point is that the dire warnings of Fatima are entirely in line with these quotes. So take heed to Fatima. We should have been war warned by Holy Writ and by saintly teachings down through the ages. Heaven found it necessary to send Our Lady in the most extraordinary miracle seen by so many people to try to get us back on course. I often, in my work, quote, use a quote from David Knowles in his very useful small book entitled simply Christian Monasticism. And he writes this, the Christian church became a certain point in its history, what it has in large measure remained ever since, a large body in which a few are exceptionally observant and devout. While many are sincere believers without any pretension to fervor, and a sizable number, perhaps even a majority, are either on their way to losing their faith or retain it in spite of a life which neither obeys in all respects the commands of Christ nor shares in the devotional and sacramental life of the church with regularity. Under such conditions there has always occurred a revolt of some or many against what seems to be to them prevailing laxity. They choose the narrow way which in the words of Jesus leads to eternal life. Well, my friends, that is manifestly true. I pray, God, that more of us will wake up wherever, wherever you're at in your spiritual journey and embrace that narrow way and pursue it with greater fervency. That is the call of Fatima. But so many of our people just don't get it. I want to offer you one more personal story about now, by way of il illustration, I'll say. One time, after I had discovered Fatima and the Rosary, I was walking past a storefront in Chicago that had a poster prominently displayed advertising for a local parish. Our Lady of Fatima, Las Vegas night. <laughs> We've all seen similar things. <laughs> Unclear on the concept. What nonsense. Almost blasphemy to attach that with Our Lady. But a very common, unfortunately. Now that was my introduction to a certain type of Catholicism. More honored in the breach than in the observance. I used to ask myself, how could the world fail to stand up and take notice of Fatima? 
And now I ask, how can the church to which this has been delivered fail to stand up and take notice? We've been lulled. Too often it seems to have become a routine part of Catholic commonplaces, platitudes, and empty notions and motions of rituals not coming from the heart. Fatima is not just a curious part of Marian teaching. It's not just a bauble. It is to be ranged under the headings of prophetic warning and divine grace a timely mercy offered against the judgment of God. And I would add, it is a power, a potentially powerful in its apologetic use to draw others to believe in Christ. What an evidence of the reality of God and his divine solicitude. I will tell you what I think you ought not to do, don't get distracted in those things given to the church's leadership to decide. Not unless you're running for bishop. Don't just become an apparitional groupie who never listens to the messages. Go back and listen to the divine son. That's what Our Lady calls us to. It's that simple. The church has long said, and with good reason, that God has granted us everything necessary to lead a holy life and attain to salvation. We do not agree. And that goes back to the earliest years of the church. Why then such a special and spectacular, extraordinary revelation? Ask and realize that this is indeed an urgent extraordinary warning to repent like the prophets of old Jeremiah and all the others who for years called out shuv, shuv in Hebrew, repent, turn, turn but when God in his great mercy gave the people of Israel time what did they do with it? they didn't make use of it they didn't turn and the disaster came and swept them away so too, Jesus said to his fellow Jews and to us, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Fatima is just such a spectacular and special reminder. I realize, of course, quite a few of you here are, in fact, doing all the right sorts of things and offering real reparation. God bless you. The fate of our world in some large part hangs on you. And so I say to you, do not become weary. And may God bless you even more as you, pre as you press on. Please press on in reparation, prayer, and your study of the scriptures and church teaching. You may be a good part of the reason that God's judgment has been delayed or averted. Keep to your part of the message, though, and don't become preoccupied with the Pope's role in so-called secrets. What is there in the word secret that you don't understand? <laughs> And if perchance you have been granted some privileged insight into such things, I would suggest that you simply pray rather than pontificate on them. Please confine yourself to your own pressing duties just as Our Lady indicated. Therefore, I say to my fellow Catholics and to all believers, to that minority who take their faith seriously. We have a limited time on earth and eternity looms before us. So stand to your duty and implore God for his mercy, not only for yourselves, but for all who have wandered so far away. 
Realize the danger. It is urgent. This message from 1917 still presses in on us today, and time is running out. Forget the Catholic cheerleader. Lament for your sins and trust in God. Offer up prayers and sacrifices and reparations for the abysmal state of our church and for all Christendom so-called. Do penance, but do not lose hope and rejoice in the mercy of God. And as always, remember as the psalmist has said, when today you hear his voice, harden not your hearts. Well, you see, history does matter, especially in this case. But God bless you. Other, other recordings and stuff like that. And of course, David's accessible, and, and there are other people from uh, Irenaeus Tubit, that Irenaeus Tubit, that Irenaeus Tubit, that Irenaeus Tubit.